from one Big 12 team to another. The only question was, could the same story as Game 1 be told in Game 2 of the 1997 season? Welcome to Episode 3 of Road to the Victors, the story of the 1997 Michigan Wolverines. I am your host, Andrew Hammond, Assistant Sports Editor at the Detroit Free Press. On this journey, we'll take you game by game, week by week, to give you the inside look at how the 1997 Michigan Wolverines captured a national title. Following the season opening victory against the Colorado Buffaloes, the Michigan Wolverines faced another Big 12 team, a rarity back then, facing two teams from the same conference in non-conference play during the regular season. This time, the opponent is the Baylor Bears. To celebrate the 25th anniversary of the Michigan Wolverines, the Free Press is producing a commemorative book, Hail Yes, the story of the 1997 Michigan Wolverines. You can pre-order the book at um.pictorial.book.com. If you would view Colorado as one of the top teams in the Big 12, the Baylor Bears slide all the way down at the other end of the spectrum. The Bears were early in the third year of what would be a 16-year bowl drought. Baylor were one of the surprise teams to be accepted into the Big 12, a conference that had just one season under its belt at the time. Many speculate that it was a former Texas governor and Baylor alum, Ann Richards, whose influence may have put the Bears into the newly formed league. However, the Bears struggled out of the gate, not finishing a season above 500 until 2010. In his first season as head coach, Dave Roberts entered the Michigan game 1-1 one one after opening the season with a loss against Miami, but rebounding with a win over Fresno State. Joining me as we take a deeper dive into this game is Gene Myers, the former sports editor at the Detroit Free Press. Coming up next, we talk about the game on Road to the Victors, the story of the 1997 Michigan Wolverines. We officially have kickoff in the big house. I'm Andrew Hammond. This is Road to the Victors, and I am joined by Gene Myers, former Free Press sports editor. And Gene, as we begin to break down this game, this Baylor team isn't the Baylor that you and I and most of the country are used to now. Uh, it's a Baylor team that just quite frankly, is not good and was at the lower half of the Big 12, and especially entering this game, they were clearly outmatched. We have kickoff at the Big House. Uh, this isn't the Baylor Bears team that uh, people aren't used to. Uh, Baylor is one of the uh, best programs in the Big 12 and of course, always a New Year's Six Bowl contender now. But Gene, I'm joined by Gene Myers, the former Free Press editor, a sports editor. Gene, what are some of your memories about the Baylor program at that time? Well, at the time, the Big 12 just basically started the original Big 8, which everyone just thinks of Nebraska and Oklahoma just as at the time people thought of the Big Ten as Michigan and Ohio State, uh, expanded. And when the Southwest Conference went under, they picked up four Texas schools, Texas, Texas A&M, Baylor, and Texas Tech. And uh, just so everyone knows, I'm a University of Kansas alumni. And when the Big Eight became the Big 12, uh, Kansas, which let's just say is horrible in football now, at that time was just lousy. and thinking that my conference was going to pick up Texas and Texas A&M was scary. But the fact that Baylor was coming in was a good thing because Baylor was not good. And it was like, hey, there's a team Kansas could possibly beat, putting it up there with the Iowa States of the world and teams like that. It's like, hey, there's another chance. We could get two W's maybe. So uh, Baylor was not considered very highly at the time. Uh, they had a revolving door of coaches and just was sort of um, 
nondescript program that you know show as time's gone on has turned it around but uh it was a name program and uh michigan was playing baylor just uh nowadays they'd probably be playing what uh some directional school from a mid-major com- conference you know. eastern utah shout eastern out to utah. eastern utah eastern, the, okay. the gryffindors i don't know um, <laughs> yes but uh, for, for as bad as this game was for the bears they actually get the first points you know of the game on a field goal so shout out to baylor if you if you were you know gambling at that point in 1997 and you had baylor getting the first points of the game congratulations uh, however michigan would get their own points on the board. They would get seven on the board thanks to a Charles Woodson touchdown reception. Now, we know about Charles Woodson, the defender, but Gene, if you could, give us a little something on Charles Woodson, the offensive weapon, because I feel like a lot of people forget just how good of a triple threat he was. It's interesting about Woodson because You know, he had played a little bit on offense the previous season, and Michigan really used him sparingly much of the season on offense. Uh, It would be later in the season when he had many, many big moments. But early on, you know, everyone figured he could catch the ball. They thought, oh, maybe they'd run some reverses with him. That didn't really happen. In fact, he only had five rushes for the whole year. Of course, one for a touchdown. Uh, but it's whenever he got in the game, I was just watching the broadcast from 97 and it's like the announcers always note Charles Woodson's in the game and you can tell the other team is worried about Woodson and on the play where he scored the touchdown, uh, they were not, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. It was a first a goal, but they weren't far from the goal line. And all they did, Woodson lined up a little wide. He took like, Two steps, turned, got a pass, and then ran in the middle field right in the end zone. A couple people dove at him, and he was in. And it was just, you looked at it and said, man, he's fast. And the other Michigan receivers weren't considered that great. And here was this burner and this player who just scored. And he set all kinds of records in high school. He just was a scoring machine. And every time he came in, There was the chance something was going to happen. And at that point, he mainly was doing receiving. But by the time the year end, he had a rushing touchdown. He had two passing touchdowns He or two uh, receiving touchdowns. He should have had a passing touchdown. But later in the year, he threw one to Brian Greasy and he was knocked out of bounds like inside the five. And it's just every time. And as the year went on, they just kept using him more and more as the opponents got harder and they needed to jumpstart the offense and his, you know, if when this podcast series gets to the Rose bowl, uh, the last series that Michigan had, he had several first down and made some amazing plays as they came back and then beat Washington state. And uh, one of the biggest plays he had all year was a play where the Michigan was driving in the Rose Bowl late and they faced a third down and the call was for him to throw a pass to Chris Howard, the tailback. And Howard was sort of covered and Woodson just got a block and ran like 10 yards for a first down on third down. Or Michigan would have punted the ball back to Ryan Leaf with like five, six minutes left in the game. So he was always a threat. The other team worried about him. And when he would get the ball, he would usually do something. Uh, Very, very special, special player. It's funny you say that because I was kind of – I was going back and just kind of watching game, Michigan games uh, from 97 just to get – you know, myself prepared, you know, to cover this subject. And, and I'm one of those people that I have to be, I have to watch it visually to kind of get that inspiration and get that fire going. And it's funny you say that because I'm remembering that play where Charles looks like he's about to throw it. He and he sees, you know, Howard's covered and he just turns the corner and you're just like, this guy Charles Woodson just and we talk about ultimate weapons in college football. 
it's kind of sort of rare these days because a lot of these guys are more specialized. I think, you know, I think about Peter Wark. I think about Charles Woodson, you know, guys that you could place anywhere on the field and they're going to make an impact and you know what's going to happen. You're just thinking, okay, how and what form is he going to run? Is he going to pass? Is he going to punt? I mean, it's <laughs> yeah. It's it, it it's pretty fascinating a, a guy like Charles Woodson then how he would be considered now, but uh, we reach halftime. Michigan is in firm control of this one, leading 21-3. to We will be back for the second half of this game after the break. This is Road to the Victors, the story of the 1997 Michigan Wolverines. We are back with Road to the Victors, the story of the 1997 Michigan Wolverines. Michigan leads Baylor 21-3 at halftime, and joining me to talk about this game is Gene Myers, former sports editor at the Detroit Free Press. Gene, it's 21-3, mostly due to Michigan's run game dominating Baylor. That run game shows up again for Michigan's first score of the second half, an Anthony Thomas touchdown making the score 28-3. Now, Gene, as a Kid growing up in the 90s, watching college football, I felt Michigan was always running back you. They had this great running back lineage that was just so rich. What made this era special from about 1992-93 to about 2004-2005? Well, I think a lot of things play into that. One was part of that era sort of was the end of Bo Schembechler's time. And this was just a priority for him on offense. I mean, job one was running the ball. And that meant stud offensive line and usually a feature back who could carry the ball. Oh, and carry the ball. Oh, and keep carrying the ball. You didn't, you didn't see running back by committee. There was usually a guy. And just in that era, even though Bo was gone. He was followed by Gary Moeller, who was a protege, and then by Lloyd Carr, who worked under Bo for a long time and under Moeller. And it was the same thing. It's like, you know, like it was job one on offense. It wasn't, we need to diversify. We didn't need speed and space. It's like, we needed to beat them up on the line of scrimmage and pound the ball down their throats. And when that's your focus, and you have the talent Michigan can get and the coaches they have, you just do it. And, you know, I was looking back that, uh, you know, in that era, in 95, one of the reasons Chris Howard, who became the featured back in 97, didn't play much, that was Tim Biakabatuka time, where he set the school record for running for 1,818 yards. I mean, you don't usually ever hear of many backs getting anywhere near that these days. You, you just wouldn't give someone that many carries. Uh, before that, Howard was behind Tyrone Wheatley, who had three straight years of 1,000 yards. And the year before 97, Michigan was kind of in flux. Howard didn't really become the man. Clarence Williams didn't become the man. And going into the 97 season, they didn't really know that Howard could become the man. But two things happened. Their offensive line suddenly became this monster. And Howard turned into a monster himself who could carry the mail all the time. And from there on, you know, you just mentioned Anthony Thomas, who was a true freshman. And that was a coming out game for him against Baylor, scoring a touchdown. I think it was, what did he do in that game? He had yeah, 21 carries for 121 yards. In fact, Michigan rushed 61 times for 344 yards. You don't do that by accident. That's a, that's the DNA of your program. But Thomas, who basically ended up backing up Howard, became Michigan's all-time career rushing leader, surpassing Wheatley, because he was just a load. And he did it that year as a freshman, and then he did it three more. So uh, 
why did they have great running backs? Because that was how the program was built. And, you know, they had four lost seasons, uh, or four lost season in uh, 96 when they didn't have a man. And that was a big concern there. And, you know, it's, it, it just shows you uh, if you have to do the job and that's your priority, well, <laughs> you better be good at it. And they were almost all the time. <laughs> That is very true. Michigan would go on to put up 10 more points, making the final score Michigan 38, Baylor 3. The Wolverines are 2-0 and undefeated against the Big 12. So at this point, they lead the conference without being a member. So congratulations, Michigan. You should probably also claim a share to the Big 12 title. I don't know who you talk to about that. It might be statute of limitations type thing. Uh, Having beaten Colorado the week before. So Michigan is 2 and 0. They've got rival Notre Dame the following le- the following week. But is there any belief in this team that yeah, this team is not only a conference title contender, you know, uh, not even a national title contender at this point either. Are they good enough to win the league? Like are you getting that sense that this is a team that can make some hay not only in the Big 10 but maybe in the nation? You know, what I remember at the time, there are Michigan fans that are always wanted to believe, okay, this could be our year. Because Michigan was always highly ranked. And they moved up to, what, number eight in the country after they beat Colorado. They would move up to number six after beating Baylor. Now, there was always that belief. And Lloyd Carr at the time was unbeaten in his two plus seasons in September games. So it's like, they always had started out really well. And Lloyd in his two plus seasons also though, had always beaten a lot of really good teams. Like he had beaten Ohio state twice and they were number two in the country and they beat Colorado. That was a bit of a surprise that they dominated them, but not a shock that Michigan won another big game. Their problem at the time is they were losing games that they shouldn't be losing, and they were struggling with lesser opponents. So in a lot of ways, well, I think the rest of the country was truly impressed by beating Colorado, which a lot of people thought might be a top five team. I think fans just in the area were more impressed that they destroyed Baylor because it's like they didn't just dink around and get into a close game and because it was the year before they lost at Purdue in a terrible, terrible game. And it's like this time you just say, oh, my gosh, they just ran him out of the building. And I'm sure everyone was thinking, hey, maybe this team is different. Maybe this team is different. Maybe, you know, the easier games will be easier. And it especially helped, too, to have Notre Dame coming up. Now, Notre Dame would go into that game one and two because they had lost to Michigan State, but they were still Notre Dame. And everyone, I'm sure, was thinking, man, it'd be great to beat them, but oh my gosh, we could lose. (laughs) So I think there were, and when uh, I worked on that Michigan book this past summer, you know, looking back and doing research, you know, the free press was writing, you know, there was like hope for people that maybe this team would be better than what is expected, that they would possibly be a Big Ten contender. And now it's like, oh, yeah, maybe they could be a little more. But there was still doubt. But, you know, if when you're a fan, you have to have hope, even if you're a Lions fan. <laughs> and I'm sure a lot of Michigan fans were thinking, you know, maybe, maybe. And several things had gone really well. One, Greasy had done a good job in his first two games. And the offensive line despite having some penalty issues, like in the Baylor game, there were quotes from like Greasy. Well, one quote Greasy had was, some of those holes I saw were enormous. And Chris Howard said, we're not used to seeing holes as big as they were today. And <laughs> the offensive line got all these rays, which was the offensive line was probably the biggest question mark in the team other than maybe Greasy. And it's like Michigan fan, no, going back to that DNA, you got a good offensive line. Yeah, there's hope. There's there's lots of hope. So, but 
we, you know, as the season unfolds, there'll be lots of moments where uh, fans can be excited and also have that lingering doubt if whether they can actually go all the way. <laughs> I was going to say, yeah, it's one of those things where, you know, early on in the season is, you know, you're, 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 you're wondering, you, you're trying to figure out where you are at in terms of, you know, just looking to see, is this team going to do something? And yeah, it's, it feels like after two games, you're thinking, okay, things are okay right now. It's like you're walking this like treacherous trail yeah. of, you know, 12 games and you're just like, okay, where are the traps coming? Where, But yeah, it feels like right now you're, you know, the yellow brick or the, the maze yes. brick road, I should say, <laughs> is, 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 is fine. Everything's paved. Everything's good. But then, you know, you've got a, a, a leprechaun looming next week in the big house and you got to deal with that. So, you know, we'll, but we will, uh, we'll, we'll save that for next week. But when we come back, we will talk about what's going on around the country in 1997 when we return to Road to the Victors, the story of the 1997 Michigan Wolverines. When Michigan blasted the Baylor Bears 38-3, there were some things going on around college football that would play a very important part in Michigan's 1997 season. In Seattle, Washington and Gainesville, Florida, two games happening at the same time helped chart the course for what would be one of the greatest and wildest college football seasons in history. Entering 1997, Tennessee Volunteers quarterback Peyton Manning returned to college for his senior season after bypassing the NFL and looking to cap a legendary college career. There were four things he was looking to add to his already legendary resume. Beat the rival Florida Gators, who he had lost to in his first three seasons at Tennessee. Second, win an SEC championship, something he hadn't done, largely due to Florida's dominance under head coach Steve Spurrier. Third, win a Heisman Trophy, something he hadn't done despite finishing in the top 10 in 1995 and 1996. Fourth, and probably most important, win a national championship, something that seemed to be a lock only if he beat the Florida Gators, who, ironically enough, are the defending national champions. On a sweltering day in what folks call the Swamp, Manning and the Vols lose to the Gators 33-20, to knocking Tennessee from the ranks of the unbeaten and out of the national title race. However, Unlike the Heisman races we see in the current day, Manning's loss in a big game doesn't cost him, for now at least. While the Heisman race is being shaped on one side of the country, the national title race officially hit first gear with the Nebraska Cornhuskers facing the Washington Huskies. It was a matchup of the 1994 and 95 national champions, Nebraska, against the second-ranked team in the country, the Washington Huskies. Nebraska showed that the slip-up in 1996, spoiling their chance to defend a national title, was a thing of the past. With a 34-24 road victory, Nebraska firmly put themselves into the national title hunt. Michigan remained in that group of teams that were still seen as pretenders and not contenders after their win over Baylor. They moved up from 8 to 6 in the latest polls, mostly due to Tennessee and Washington losing. The Wolverines would need a few more weeks of impressive play to convince those around the nation that they were for real. That first opportunity would be the following week against longtime rival Notre Dame at Michigan Stadium. Before we go, our guest has been Gene Myers. Anjanette Delgado and Kirkland Crawford are the executive producers of this podcast. Carrie Jr. II provides technical support. 
Peter Batia is the editor of the Detroit Free Press. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe to Road to the Victors on Apple, Spotify, or your preferred streaming app of choice. And find us at freep.com slash podcast. Please subscribe, leave a rating, and tell your friends about us. It really does help. For more information on the 1997 Michigan team, pre-order the book, Hail Yes, the story of the 1997 Michigan Wolverines at Freep.com. I'm Andrew Hammond, and we'll see you next week.